or our next example, we have some really similar code. This code, rather than going to I squared, goes to the floor of radical I, though, which is a little strange. So we're going to, in this video, see that that floor is mostly a technicality and will be ignored in the future. But for now, we are going to actually keep it in the problem and see how it affects things. Just like before, we are going to take the for loops and then to convert them into summations. All of that remains the same. We should maybe define what t of n is. So t of n is the runtime of funk or some other such thing to let the reader know what this thing we're talking about is. Then we can write t of n as two summations, the sum from i equals 1 to n of the sum from j equals 1 to the floor of radical i of the inside thing there's the exact same thing we've dealt with before it takes constant time just as we've seen with all of our examples in the past we start with the innermost summation j does not appear inside of the sum and so we take the inside of the summation and multiply by the number of terms the same exact first step we've done several times by now so t of n is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of c times the floor of radical i no, even if the floor function wasn't there, we would still need to bound this. There is no formula for radical i. So this one we have to bound above and below. Before we were choosing to do that because it turned out to be easier, usually than not bounding below. So instead, we're going to have to bound this. So we're going to bound this above and below. So bound above. Let us... Begin by writing down what t of n is. It is that summation. So t of n is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of the floor of radical i. Uh, I forgot a c. There we go. So we want to bound this above. The first thing I'm going to observe is that radical i rounded down is always less than or equal to radical i because we're rounding it down. So this is less than or equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of c times radical i. Because we're again, rounding that down. If that turned out to be radical five, that is two point something that gets rounded down to two. So it is definitely always less than or equal to radical i once we plug in an integer. So we can now bound above using our normal techniques, replace the term in the summation with the largest that appears. This is an increasing function. So to make it as large as possible, we replace i with, rat with n. So we have c radical n. And now we've removed i from the summation. This is now a fixed term that we're adding up a fixed number of times. So this is equal to n times c radical n. And hopefully you can look at that and go, we combine the n and radical n. This is hopefully clearly c n to the three halves. So all of this work buys us that we are in big O of n to the three halves. We need to also bound it below. Let's find out how we can contend with the floor function there. So bound below. To bound this below, just like when we bounded above, we are going to start by writing down the summation. t of n is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to radical n of c times the floor of radical i. And now the floor of radical i is definitely always bigger than radical i minus 1, because the rounding down will just remove the decimal part. So if I subtract 1 from radical i, that will definitely be a smaller number. So this is greater than or equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of c times radical i minus 1. And now we no longer have the floor function, so now we're doing our normal bounding technique. We're going to split the summation in half. So this is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n over 2 of the sum and, which is c times radical i minus 1, plus the sum from i equals n divided by 2 plus 1 to n of c times radical i minus 1. And now, because this is an increasing summation, we're going to keep the larger half, which is the second half of the term. So this is greater than or equal to the sum from i equals n divided by 2 plus 1 to n of c. And then I'm going to replace i with n over 2. We've seen this a couple of times already. We're going to combine those two steps into a single step now. Now we have eliminated i from the summation, so we can take the sum and, and multiply by the number of terms. So this is equal to the top bound minus the bottom bound 
plus 1 times the sum end, which is C times radical n over 2 minus 1. And now we, the first thing there, the number of terms in the summation, simplifies in a nice way because we designed it to do so. We have n minus n over 2. That's n over 2 minus 1 and plus 1 cancel in a very nice way. So we have n over 2 times. Ew, that's a little ugly. So we have radical n over 2. Hmm. So we're going to try and replace the minus 1 with something that looks like radical n and is smaller. So off to the side, I'm going to replace negative one is greater than or equal to negative radical n over, let's make it a nice small number so we don't need to worry about whether or not it is going to be negative or not. I'm gonna multiply by negative eight on both sides. That's eight less than or equal to radical n or n bigger than or equal to 64. So you could choose something else. I just chose eight because the choice is arbitrary and that, that's definitely not going to cause any weird cancellations to occur. So. This is bigger than or equal to, using that substitution I just commented on, we have cn over 2, if I combine all those terms, times radical n over radical 2 minus radical n over 8. And then I just need to get a common denominator between those and combine them. This is equal to cn over 2 times the first one I'm going to have to multiply by 8. So we have 8 radical n minus the second one I'm going to have to multiply by radical 2 times radical n, all divided by radical 2 times 8. Ooh, looking really messy. There's not really any way around it here, unfortunately. I could factor a radical n out of that and have some horrifying constant, which is c over 2 times 8 minus radical 2 over 8 radical 2 times n to the 3 halves. Ugh, messy. It's some constant. I don't particularly care what number that is, but 8 minus radical 2, definitely a positive number, which is why I made it 8. You could have chosen something like 4, and that would have worked as well. However, I decided to make it uh, 8 just to be absolutely cautious. So we have some horrifying number times n to the 3 halves, some other number times n to the 3 halves, so it must be in theta of n to the 3 halves. So let's write down our final conclusion then. Since t of n is in big O of n to the 3 halves. That's the stuff we did for red. And T of n is in omega of n to the 3 halves. We know T of n must be in theta of n to the 3 halves. Which, this wasn't too bad, other than the end where it got really messy to keep bounding it below. So unfortunately, sometimes the constants get really messy in these problems because of the fact that radical 2 is irrational. We proved that earlier in the class. There's really no nice common denominator you can get here. Notice the floor function didn't do anything other than make this tedious. So going forward, you do not need to contend with the floor function. I'm OK with you just ignoring it. All it does is it makes problems more tedious. So. In the future, ignore the floor function. You are allowed to do that. You have my complete consent to do that. There are some cases where it will matter. We will comment on where it theoretically is relevant that we are rounding things down. It is very few and far between when that occurs, though.